Hello and welcome to the introduction on how to use the slide navigation and interactive features in Storyline 360. At the top of the slide, you can see the module number, lesson number, and lesson name, indicating the current lesson. The player bar is located at the bottom of the screen. It includes the play pause button on the left, the seek bar that allows you to control the slide timeline by dragging it, and the replay button to restart the slide. You can adjust the volume by clicking on the speaker icon. To enable closed captions, simply press the CC button. You can also adjust the playback speed by clicking this button here. Additionally, there is a full-size screen option available by clicking the screen icon on the right-hand side. If you want to skip slides, there are two options available. The first option is to use the next or previous buttons located at the bottom right corner of the slide. You can navigate through the slides one by one using these buttons. The second option is to open the menu bar by clicking the highlighted icon at the top left corner. In the menu, you will find a list of slide sections. Note that the current slide will be highlighted whilst the slides you have already viewed are marked with ticks. By opening the menu bar, you can jump to any slide you wish to visit in this lesson. However, it is possible that some lessons may have this feature restricted until you have viewed the slides in the prescribed order. If you click on the transcript tab on the right side of the menu, you will have access to the transcript. To search for specific slides in the lesson, click on the magnifying glass icon and enter the keyword to initiate the search. If there are resources available for the lesson, you can easily access them by clicking the resources button at the top right corner. When a hand cursor appears on a slide, you can click it to jump to the corresponding timestamps. This feature allows you to quickly navigate to the mentioned points or highlighted sections on the timeline. If you would like to learn more about EIT's world leading education and training courses, click on the screen or visit us at our website. We look forward to supporting your professional development journey. From all of us at the Egler Institute of Technology, we wish you all the best for your studies. A very warm welcome to the Introduction to Capability Design and Systems Engineering session. I'm Mark Egler and I'll be your instructor for this lesson. Before we dive into the detail, I would like to briefly introduce you to the idea of complexity. Complexity is all around us. It pervades everything we do and particularly in the military it is a fundamental issue that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Much of this complexity is represented in the capability systems bought by the military and their interactions with the external environment. A rough measure of determining the complexity of the system is by assessing whether an individual can keep all the details about a single project or capability system in their head. Unless you're a polymath, you can see that this is simply not possible to do this for modern, complex capability systems used by military forces. So, much of this course is going to be spent learning about different methods and techniques to unpick this complexity, and how to define, specify and design complex systems. These will assist you to develop coherent, well-reasoned capability design and systems engineering documents. During the lesson I am going to introduce you to what constitutes a capability, and how capability systems are developed and used to deliver military operational effects. I will outline the use of capability proposals and how this document is used to describe the rationale and need for new capability systems. You will learn that developing capability proposals needs to be underpinned by disciplined and rigorous operational analysis and that this process is absolutely essential in successfully designing new capability systems. The capability proposal also provides the essential bridge between the operational and system domain. This work, which is often referred to as front-end system design, takes place within the well-established systems engineering framework. I will also spend some time considering the importance of using a coherent capability design information architecture. Such architectures greatly assist in the systematic capture of large amounts of information generated during the capability design process. 
I will also introduce you to systems engineering and the role of model-based systems engineering in the design of complex systems. So what is a capability? Various definitions can be found by exploring the multitude of references easily accessible on the internet. Wikipedia describes capability as the ability to perform certain actions or achieve certain outcomes. And this definition is somewhat extended by the Oxford Dictionary as the power or ability to do something. But both of these definitions are not sufficient for use in the military context. The ADF definition says that capability is the power to achieve a desired operational effect in a nominated operating environment within a specific time, and to sustain that effect for a designated period. The military definition introduces three important additional factors. The first one relates to the capability effect being delivered in a particular operational environment, which can be either in the land, sea, or air domain. And it also introduces two temporal constraints relating to delivering the capability effect within a specified time, and then being able to sustain that effect over a set period. But how do we deliver capability? A surveillance capability, as you can see on this slide, is made up of a broad range of elements. Some of the elements occur within the primary system of interest comprising sensors, response, operators and analysis capabilities. These elements deliver the primary operational effects of the surveillance capability, and are often referred to as the mission system. But there are also a range of elements external to the mission system. These are made up of things such as the ability to maintain and supply the various surveillance capabilities, their supporting infrastructure, and a range of personnel-related elements covering training and recruitment. You can also observe on the diagram that elements within the mission system are dependent on external elements to make them viable. It is therefore the totality of the system which includes both the mission system, its support system, and the supporting external elements that constitutes the capability. Within the military we refer to this totality of internal and external systems as the fundamental inputs to capability. Another example of a complex system made up of a broad range of fundamental inputs to capability is that of an amphibious assault capability. In this example the operational effect of amphibious assault is delivered by a combination of major systems that include landing craft, armored vehicles, air support, dismounted infantry and a beach landing reconnaissance team. The mission system in this example is delivered by these five elements. Again, to raise, train and sustain the amphibious assault capability requires a broad range of external support systems covering maintenance and support infrastructure various types of training and a complex array of processes and procedures that deliver the required coordination and organizational relationships. As mentioned earlier, it is simply not possible to design such complex military capabilities in one's head. The design of complex military capability requires a systematic and comprehensive capability design process that can confidently yield a capability system satisfying the user's operational need.